thank you very much, Brian. After that terrific introduction, I think I should just leave now. <laughs> it's all kind of downhill from here. But I am very pleased uh, to, to, to be here. I have uh, great admiration for both the Ford School of Public Policy and the Michigan School of Education. I have friends at both places and have learned a great deal from the work of scholars at both uh, schools. So as Brian said, I want to talk about um, uh, patterns in U.S. high school graduation rates. Uh, this is based on a paper that I wrote for an economics journal, so it's, you'll see it's more economics-y perhaps than it might have been if I had written it for a different kind of journal, although uh, I won't put any, there's no mathematics in it or anything else. Okay, so um, this is from a speech that President Obama gave in uh, 2009. We have one of the highest high school dropout rates of any industrialized nation. So clearly a concern at the presidential level. Also, if you look at the, how do we compare with other industrialized uh, countries in high school graduation rates? Well, in 1965, we rank first among the 28 or 30 OECD countries. It includes most of the countries, uh, large countries whom we trade with. In, uh, over the next uh, 20 or 30 years, uh, many of these other OECD countries increased their high school graduation rate quite markedly. The net effect is that uh, in 2008, America ranked 19th among uh, 28 OECD uh, countries. Now, why should we care? And why should we worry about this? Well, one reason is that uh, and this is uh, a theme that's well developed in Claudia Golden and Larry Katz's terrific book called The Race Between Education and Technology, is that rising educational attainments fueled the rapid economic growth during the first 70 years of the 20th century that made the kind of economic pie grow at a, at a steady rate and that large economic pie allowed standards of living for virtually all Americans to rise. A second reason, again, is that education is the primary mechanism of upward social mobility in the United States. And this idea that a child may grow up poor, but his children won't grow up poor very much lies at the root of what America thinks of what's good about itself. This is dramatically threatened when we have stagnation in high school graduation rates. Something that uh, many Americans are not aware of is, if you talk to Europeans you know, who will chastise Americans because we have higher rates of economic inequality than many European countries, and most European countries have, the Americans will respond but say, yes, we have this high rate of socioeconomic mobility. The most recent data shows the rate of intergenerational socioeconomic mobility is lower in the US than it is in most European countries. And the stagnation in educational attainments is a key part of that. So that's why we should care about this. Now, what are the questions? I'm going to try and address four questions. The first is, what are the important patterns in high school graduation rates? The second is, what are the most compelling explanations for these? And my guess is that's where a lot of the discussion will have under, with Q&A. Uh, what's known about effective strategies to increase high school graduation rates? Talk about that. And then finally, a kind of different, more researchy question is, what's the challenge in making policy evaluations more useful to folks on the ground trying to increase the number of American youth who graduate from high school? How do we make research more valuable to that effort? So those are the four questions I want to try and address. Now, just a few kind of uh, words to start is uh, 
just, I'll be very brief on these methodological issues. But clearly, you know, how do we measure high school graduation rates? Well, it turns out it's not so easy to think of how to do it. There basically are three ways of doing it, each of which has problems. And the problems are different, which is one reason why we see very different estimates of high school graduation rates. And these uh, differences matter particularly for certain subgroups, particularly minority group uh, members. So one way of doing it is a so-called status completion rate. So that's kind of the most straightforward, perhaps most transparent. That is, for example, if we have surveys of a nationally representative sample of Americans, as we have, and we'll talk about that in a minute, we could, for example, take a national representative sample of 20 to 24 year olds, and we could simply ask them, what's the highest education you completed? And from their answers, we could say, well, okay, some percentage of them graduated from high school or perhaps went beyond that. That would be our estimate of the status completion rate. The sample that you, the, you, the data set that's free, most frequently used for this is the current population survey. That's a survey that's administered to about 60,000 American households every month. That's where the information comes from on the monthly unemployment rate. So that's a common estimate. It's very straightforward. Now, what are the problems with that? Well, one problem is um, it's a single individual who answers the questions for everyone in the household. And so the question would be part is, do they know? But perhaps more important, do they perhaps exaggerate a bit? And do they, now of course that's particularly important if, if groups with particular attributes are more likely to exaggerate, or if over time people become more or less likely to exaggerate. In other words, so those would be sources of uh, problems with our estimation of differences in high school graduation rates across groups or over time. Another problem with the current population survey is it doesn't include people who are in group quarters. It doesn't include people who are incarcerated and people who are in the military. The census does that, but the census, of course, is only once every 10 years, and that's why we now have the American Community Survey, which gives us uh, recent estimates of high school graduation rates, but that also has its own problems. The second is the so-called the cohort graduation rate. And this has been around for a very long time, for at least 40 years. The US Department of Education asks every state to report to it every year the number of people who are enrolled in public schools in the state at each grade level, information that states get from local school districts. So you collect all that information and you know uh, how many individuals there were who were in ninth grade in the country, and that's in public schools, and also is reported how many students graduated. So you could in principle take the number of students who graduated in a particular year, divided by the number of students who started grade nine four years earlier, and that would be an estimate of the high school graduation rate. That's done, that's called the cohort graduation rate. Among the problems with that is we don't have any information from that in the 11% of Americans who are, uh, attend private high schools. Of course, if none of these surveys do we virtually know anything about the 3% of Americans who are homeschooled. I mean, that's just a, a complete uh, uh, black, uh, black hole. Uh, also, there are problems with if kids move across states, as they do, we can lose them. So there's a number of problems with that. Another bigger problem is the number of students in grade nine is not the same as the number of students who started grade nine at the beginning of the year. Uh, as you'll show in a minute, uh, kids repeating grade nine is a very common phenomenon, particularly in, in recent years, and particularly in urban high schools. So that's a problem in getting the denominator in this ratio. So the last thing is we can look at longitudinal surveys. My guess is that a number of have looked at uh, the NCES longitudinal surveys, such as High School and Beyond, NELS 88, that follow large samples of American students over time and collects information on what happens to them. 
That's, uh, there are a number of surveys that do that. That's a terrific source of information. One problem with it is most of those surveys start when kids are in grade 10. Uh, the exception is a National Educational Longitudinal Survey of, the class high of kids who are in eighth grade in 1988. That starts when kids are in eighth grade. It's, a, it's been shown that about a third of the kids in from, who drop out of high school in this Nell's 88 survey do so before the middle of grade 10. So they'd be totally missed from all these other surveys that start collecting data when kids are in grade 10. Now, another relatively new source of information are the longitudinal databases collected by State Department of Education. The federal government has provided grants to a large number of states to develop longitudinal databases where they follow every child from the date they enter public schools in the state until they leave and use that to collect information on high school graduation rates. And that's a promising strategy. There are problems with that as too, for example, when kids leave to go to private schools or when kids leave the state or when kids simply disappear. And we'll see that. So these are basically, that's enough on methodology. Three ways of doing it. Uh, the estimates that we get uh, vary a bit. They tend to be lowest when we use this height, this cohort graduation rate method. They tend to be uh, highest when you use the status completion rate method. How much of that is people exaggerating the educational attainments of their children or parents remains to be seen. Okay, now, uh, the other big, the kind of 500 pound gorilla in estimating high school graduation rates is how do you count people who left high school, subsequently took these eight hours of examinations in five different subject areas, achieved passing scores, and were awarded this alternative credential called the General Educational Development Credential, or more typically called the GED. Uh, it's, uh, it's an important question because it's not a small number. It's basically half a million Americans get that credential every year. Now, one, uh, so and it's increased if you look at people in their 20s who are, quote, high school completers, about 12% of them now are actually GED recipients. So clearly, our estimates high school graduation rates are going to be enormously sensitive as to whether we count those as high school graduates or whether we count them as dropouts. It's going to be particularly the case, it's going to have a biggest impact on African Americans and minor and Hispanics because they're even more likely than our non-Hispanic whites to take this alternative route to high school completion. Now, there's been a number of papers, some that uh, my group has done, some that Jim Heckman, the Nobel Prize in Economics, and his collaborators have written that have shown quite dramatically that uh, high that individuals who get a GED on average don't fare as well in the labor market or in post-secondary education as to people with conventional high school diplomas. Okay. And for that reason, in the numbers I'm going to show you, to the extent that I can, I've counted, I followed the NCS practice of counting GEDs as not as high school graduates. Okay. So in other words, and the stock, the uh, in these three methods. Some, one of them, the status completion rate, counts GEDs as high school graduates. It's not the case in your estimate of these cohort graduation rates. So what you do with GEDs really matters. So if you're looking at numbers on high school graduation rates, you want to look at the footnotes right away. If it's not in the footnote of the text, it ought to be. And say, how are they counting GEDs? <coughs> makes a huge difference in our estimates of high school graduation rates, particularly for minority group members. Okay, so the first question, what are the patterns? Well, the first pattern, really, as I said, as I said before, is this extraordinary stagnation since the early 1970s. So these are estimates from three different data sources on high school graduation rates for U.S. from 1950 up through 2008. Now, if we carry this back to the year uh, 1900, which would be about here, it would be at 
in 1900, according to Golden and Katz's book, climbed precipitously in the first uh, 70 years of the 20th century has been just remarkably flat since the early 1970s. While again, the high school graduation rate in, mo in many other countries that we compete with has grown, and that's the reason why U.S. has fallen from first to 19th. Okay, so that's the first big pattern to explain, the stagnation. That's a bit tough to explain because you know, it's kind of like understanding or trying to understand why the dog didn't bark. Right? Tough question to answer. Okay, the uh, <laughs> second are these substantial and deeply troubling gra uh, uh, gaps by race ethnicity and less well known by family income. And those are quite striking. Uh, the race ethnicity gaps are between 10 and 20 percentage points depending on which method you use to estimate high school graduation rates, but they're substantial. The uh, gap between if you rank American uh, children by the, their socioeconomic status of their parents, the high school graduation rate of youths whose parents are in the top quartile, the top 25%, is 31 points higher than the high school graduation rate of kids whose parents' socioeconomic status ranks in the bottom quartile. Just deeply troubling, particularly when we're, if we're concerned with socioeconomic mobility. And that's a value that I think really cuts across political ideologies in the United States. The idea that one may grow up poor, one's children will not. This deeply challenges that. Okay. The third and is growing gaps favoring females. Uh, Sudanarski has written uh, uh, with Martha Bailey, another uh, Michigan faculty member, a very nice paper on these gaps favoring females, yet particularly among college students and college enrollment and college graduation rates. And as Sue has pointed out, it's in some sense tougher to think about than our gaps by socioeconomic status. Gaps by socioeconomic status, you can think of lots of reasons why Kids growing up in poor families are going to have a tougher time than kids growing up in African families, in, in affluent families. But gaps by gender, when the kids are growing up in the same families, as Sue has pointed out, we need to think more creatively in trying to understand those patterns. Okay, now this is the only graph that's got is this has many more numbers on it than, my, than it ought to, as my colleague and friend I. John Willett is quick to tell me, but I just want to explain it and point to a couple of patterns here because it'll help you to understand uh, how, what, why certain patterns, particularly gaps by race ethnicity and by gender, are very sensitive to a couple of decisions that you need to make. So what we have here is, this is information on for all kids who are rising ninth graders in Massachusetts public high schools in 2003. Then from this state longitudinal database, six and a half years later, so in the summer of 2010, we ask what their status is. And there's lots of possibilities. We, they could have graduated from high school, and we know that, that's, that's good. That's the first column that they could have dropped out and perhaps have gotten a GED. That's the second column. They could still be enrolled. And striking, there are a little less than 1% who still are going into a seventh year. Uh, they could have transferred either to a private school or out of the state. That's another column. They could have disappeared from a longitudinal database. Or, now, so notice those three still enroll, transfer, and missing. You don't know what happened to them in terms of ultimately the high school outcome. And that, that's a real problem. And depending on the quality of a state's uh, data collection effort, uh, people slip between those categories. Whether you know they've gone to a private school or you know, or you know they've gone from Michigan to Indiana, 
is very dicey and tricky to get good information on. So basically, so if you look down, now why does it matter? Well, if you notice for the, on the red row there, which are for Hispanics, we started ninth grade in 2003, for almost 19% of them fall into this category, we don't know what they were doing six years. So how do you treat, how do you count those people for whom we don't know? Well, uh, we could take them out of the denominator entirely. And if we do that, then we can come up with an estimate. But of course, we're missing a lot of what may be going on that we don't know about. So that's a key problem with these longitudinal databases. People who simply who disappear. We don't know about them, and they may not be random at all. They may, may be, in some sense, the most troubled kids. Uh, another thing to pay attention to, so the last two columns are graduation rates for those who we know what happened to them. What's the graduation rate in four years? That's the far right column. And what's the graduation rate in six years? That's the next to far right column. Well, one thing you can see, for example, if you look at Hispanics, you can see among those folks for whom we know, 55% graduated in four years, 65% graduated in six years. So here are estimates of high school graduation rates, particularly for minority group members, are going to be very sensitive to how many years we give them to graduate. That really matters. And finally, down at the very bottom on the right, these are our, rate, these are our, ga our gender gaps within race ethnicity, and you see really pretty much the same thing. So if you look at these numbers, I promised Bonnie I wouldn't go too far from the uh, mic here, so I'll come over and come back quickly. So for among African Americans, we've got a 16 point gap, gender gap for high school graduation rates measured, did they graduate often called on time in four years? And if we look at, given six years, that gap is substantially smaller at 11%. So the African American, a much larger percentage of African American males and African American females take longer than four years to graduate. Okay, so again, so this is kind of accounting stuff when you see, again, estimates of high school graduation rates. You not only want to ask about how they're treating GEDs, you ought to ask how are they, if it's from longitudinal data, what are they doing with the people who disappeared from the database? And also, how long did we give people to graduate in our estimates? So back to our patterns. So we had, uh, we talked about the first three. The fourth pattern is that half of dropouts from American high schools went to high school in 14% of the nation's schools. This is a Bob Balfant's of point, he said, if I can remember, at Hopkins. So they're concentrated in schools. They're not all urban schools. Many of them affect are in the rural south, but they are schools that overwhelmingly serve kids from poor families and kids of color. And that's a situation, in fact, that has gotten worse, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. And the final point is this big variation across states in high school graduation rates. A nice topic for, to understand. There's a lot of measurement error in this, so it's not easy to do it. But there are quite striking as differences in high school graduation rates, even among, for example, a particular race, uh, racial ethnic group. If I can find the right page here. Yes. Uh, for African American youths, the high school graduation rate in Indiana is 53%. It, and that's four year on time, it's 73% in Indiana. Well, why is that the case? Yeah. Thank you. In, Indiana is the low, Maryland's the high. Thank you, Brian and Sue. Okay. One other thing that I uh, missed here. A key, another thing that really matters when, you, when you're trying to estimate high school graduation rate for Hispanics. 
and that is, what do, you, how do you, what do you do with recent immigrants? Do you include them in the sample, or do you not? Well, why does it matter? Well, according to the American Community Survey in 2009, 7.5% uh, of, of individuals aged 20 to 24 in the United States came to the United States within the previous 10 years. Okay. So 7.5% of 2020 falls are, are relatively recent immigrants. Okay. Of those, 59% are Hispanic. Of those recent immigrants who are Hispanic, less than half among 20 to 24 year olds graduated from high school. Now many of them came and never went to high school. Many of them appeared, particularly in urban high schools, as 10th through 11th graders. So how you count them has an enormous impact on your estimates high school graduation rates for Hispanics. And of course, that's going to impact on this variation across states enormously because Hispanics are heavily concentrated in particular states. OK, what are the explanations? Now, I want to just have one slide here that's kind of the economics perspective, since I wrote this paper for an economics journal. One thing you might think would matter is how much more can you do high school graduates earn than dropouts? Because it would make sense if that has declining over time. You might think it's less, it pays off less well to graduate from high school than it did in the past. Another is how good are the up? What do you lose if you stay in school instead of working? And there's very interesting work on this that shows this matters. For example, the, the, the work I know best was done looking at data from Appalachia in the mid-1970s. After the OPEC oil crisis, the price of coal rose quite dramatically. And in effect, a lot of mines reopened, increased output, because coal was more valuable. That created lots of employment in western Pennsylvania and Ohio and that region. That led to an increase in the dropout rate. Because again, these young people had well-paying jobs available. When the coal boom faded, the dropout rate faded as well, and kids went back to school. So this matters, but can this explain national patterns? Third is uh, what uh, is a funny, basically, you can think of this as, do kids care about these long-term trends, or do they have trouble thinking beyond Friday? And clearly, if we think, if those of us who have teenagers or had teenagers, this, this thinking only to the next Friday night is very pervasive. Uh, but we do need to ask, though, is this more true for kids with certain characteristics than others? Is it more true over, is it more true now than it was 20 years ago? Because if that's a stable aspect of being a teenager, that won't help us explain any of these patterns. And finally, and this is, turns out is where all the action is, is what in funny economics language would be the non-monetary cost of completing another year of high school. How much of a drag is it to complete high school? How much time does it take? How unpleasant a process is it? Now, if I, would, if this were, if I were a sociologist or a psychologist, I would be breaking down that last category into lots of much finer grain categories. And it turns out it's in, that's where really all the action is, as we'll see. So basically, how important are each one of these? Well, as you'll see, the, the top two, which are the ones economists are most familiar with, don't get you anywhere in terms of explaining these patterns. And you can see this. These are uh, information from the current population survey. These are mean hourly wages by gender, by education group. The bottom uh, curve is dropouts. The red line in the middle is terminal high school graduates. The top line are four-year college graduates. I didn't put in the sum college because that's a messy thing to calculate. So notice uh, there's no evidence here that the gap between 
high school graduation, earnings of high school graduation, and the real wages, this, these are all net of inflation of dropouts declined. That, this gap did not get small. Now, in fact, if you look in a more fine-grained way at particular racial ethnic groups, you see it uh, even more strikingly. So basically, what you have here is the ratio of the uh, average hourly wage of dropouts divided by the average hourly wage of high school graduates who didn't go on to college. So if you notice in 1980, <coughs> For uh, whites, non-Hispanics, that's the blue curve for males, it's about 0.88, which means on average dropouts are in 12% less in 1980 than did white male high school graduates. Well, you notice with the one exception of male Hispanics, all of those lines are downward sloping, in effect. So in other words, for all these different groups, the relative wages of dropouts compared to high school graduates got worse. So, we, so by this, if this is all that's going on, this should tell us high school graduation rate should have increased. It shouldn't have stayed stagnant. You know, the key story is here, high, graduate high school paid off more than it now than it did 30 years ago. So we don't get anywhere there. Also looking at the same graph, you can see the idea, and going back one, the idea that the payoff to leaving school immediately and going to work was greater is just wrong. There's no trend ever, ever indicating that high school, grad, high school dropouts fared better in labor markets than they did in the past. And in fact, if we look even further, these are the employment to population rates among dropouts by gender. And notice, particularly for males, that's the top line, notice that strikingly downward decline. So the percentage of adult dropouts who are working, at least report working, has declined precipitously. So the idea of kids are dropping out because there's these great jobs in the coal mines just doesn't explain the pattern. Uh, nor, not, nor does the myopia. So basically, uh, we need to turn to this last category. So what's going on? How do we explain these patterns? Notice we got the stagnation, the dog that didn't bark we need to explain. Then we need to explain these gaps by gender, these gaps by race ethnicity. And one, so there's basically four parts to the story as I see it. And the four parts go together. So the first story is to think about um, as you increase the high school graduation rate, it becomes harder to increase it further. Why? Because the kids who are left are increasingly from poor families who enter school, enter high school with relatively weak skills. So that's a, just a story. It keeps getting harder. It's harder to go from 80% to 90% than it was to go 50% to 60%. That's now one you can see that is, if you look at what these are data from Massachusetts, they're purely descriptive. So the, the, the black lines on the left are evident, are the magnitude of the, the uh, black white gap in high school graduation rates. So for example, among males, the black-white gap in high school graduation rate, not controlling for anything, is about 18 percentage points. So the average high school graduation rate for black males in Massachusetts, is, and that's six-year graduation rates, is about 18 percent lower than that for white males. Then you say, well, how about if we try and hold constant the effects of low family income, which African Americans are more likely to come from low-income families. We all constant their eighth grade attendance, and most importantly, we all constant their eighth grade test scores. And, and holding constant those, notice that explains somewhere between two-thirds and three-quarters of the gap. So a big part of the story is these kids are entering high school 
really behind the eight ball. Among those kids who ultimately drop out, much more so than was the case 50 years ago. So that's the first story, is it's getting harder because we're working with kids who are, in some sense, have more strikes against them when they get to high school. They, in a, in, and you see this, my colleague Catherine Snow, who studies reading, points out that a lot of the reason kids have difficulty in, in getting out of ninth grade, which we'll see in a minute, is they enter high school without being able to read well enough to make sense of science and social studies texts in middle school or high school. The, uh, so the second story, so the first is that we're, again, we're working with kids who are, have mo face more challenges as we, as we move over time. Second is policy changes. Beginning in the mid-1970s, there was concern about the quality of uh, uh, American workforce, and that led to a, a really pretty much a, many waves of policies aimed at increasing the standards for a high school diploma. First it was minimum competency tests in the 70s, then came a nation at risk in 1983, a report many of you know about, that led to inc yet increased core requirements, number of science courses you had to pass, having to pass Algebra one or Algebra II. Uh, that was followed by exit examinations. Now, 75% of the nation's kids must pass an exit examination, typically taken in 10th grade and some states in 11th grade, in reading and mathematics, in science now in Massachusetts as well, in order to graduate. So we've increased those. And when you look now, at, there's been lots of research, Brian's done some of it, a lot of research on does increase in high school graduate, in, in standards for high, in requirements for high school diploma have an impact on the high school graduation rate. If you look at it across all kids, the answer is pretty much no. But if you then look at, how about if we focus on the kids who are most vulnerable? The kids who come from poor families, the kids who come from minority group families. What you see is, the answer is yes. You do see the, that these increasing standards make it harder. And we'll see why in, in a minute. Now, I want to be clear, I don't mean this as an attack on these attempts to increase high school graduation standards. In fact, in Massachusetts, a state that's increased standards quite dramatically, and I think done it quite well, there are lots of positive benefits from that. And you see this in how, America, how Massachusetts high school students compare in both on, on international comparisons and compared to other states. But there are these unanticipated consequences for the kids who enter high school with two and a half strikes against them. Now one way you see this is, these are percentage of Massachusetts first time ninth graders who repeat grade nine. And notice you basically got among African American, Hispanic, and urban low income kids about a quarter are repeating grade nine. So for example, if you go to East Boston High School, which is a big high school in, in a Hispanic area of Boston, there's 1,300 students in the school. Of those 1,300, 700 are ninth graders. Again, because it's the, they can't pass their core English and math courses. Now, how about how do those kids fare? These kids who, to, who repeat ninth grade? And the answer is not very well. This is the percentage of them, kids who repeat ninth grade, who graduate within six years. And if you notice, for example, among Hispanics, it's under 30%. For none of these groups, is it under, is it over 40%? So basically, failing, uh, uh, repeating ninth grade reduces the probability you graduate from high school by a whole lot. So basically, just one, so basically a combination is we're working with kids who enter high school with, in a difficult situation. We've raised the standards now. These standards affect disproportionately these vulnerable kids. Yeah, um, I was wondering, like, is it really them repeating ninth grade that causes them to have such low graduation rates, or is it more that it kind of shows that they wouldn't graduate because they have to repeat ninth grade. 
Oh, yeah, I didn't mean any. Uh, this is pure descriptive, not causal. But they've got this 10th grade exit exam ahead of them if they get there. And, and uh, a large percentage of them are on, don't pass that. They can take it again and again, but they have to pass it. And, the law, and some of them take it as many as seven times and don't pass it. Okay. Now, uh, the last, so th we got four stories. So we've got, again, we're working with kids who are poorer. We've increased standards. The third is this increasing family income inequality increases, the ch which has been a phenomenon in the United States over the last uh, 30 years, has increased the challenge for kids from low-income families of meeting these now, now higher standards. Okay, and I want to, this is, this is a volume that was just uh, published. Uh, that's the book cover. Uh, it just came out last week. Uh, Sue Donarski and Martha Bailey have a, a very nice chapter in there. Brian Jacob uh, and a colleague have a very nice paper in there. Brian Rowan has a very nice paper in there. So, and, and so Michigan is very well represented in this volume. <laughs> Basically, so how does this story work? Well, first of all, you can see this is the growth in income inequality. In 1977, it, the uh, families at the 20th percentile of income distribution earned a little less than $26,000 in 77. Families in 2009 who were at the 20th percentile earned had a, a bit higher income, 27,000, but it's virtually the same. This is all in constant dollars. So basically, no change in the earnings uh, in the income of families at the 20th percentile. How about families at the 80th percentile? 84,000 and change in 77, 113,000 in 2009. Now, why does that matter? One reason it matters is that, again, with these higher graduation standards, it poses challenges for a significant number of kids. Families that have resources, can hire tutors, can do a variety of things to meet those higher standards. Poor kids can't. You see this, for example, this is expenditures on enrichment. And these, in the, in the 1972-73, poor families, lowest 20%, spent about $835 on enrichment activities, and this is things like summer camp, trips, those kinds of things that takes kids to a ver outside of their normal experience. And wealthy families spend about $3,500. Look now, 2005, six, summit of an increase for poor families, just an extraordinary increase for kids from relatively affluent families. Now, why do we care about that? Well, this is one reason why how kids acquire background knowledge. They've been to national parks. They, they, they've been on trips. They've been to Europe. They see a whole bunch. So in other words, they just have a broader set of experience. Why does that matter? Because when reading changes from learning to read and decode words to reading to learn as in in middle school science and social studies texts, background knowledge is absolutely central to being able to make sense of textbooks. And the difficulty is many poor kids just haven't had the experiences to acquire this background knowledge. Uh, also, this is uh, again, these are gaps uh, between kids from wealthy families and poor families in uh, when they enter kindergarten is the white bars and in fifth grade are the dark bars. Basically we see kids from poor families enter school with lower reading achievement, enter school with gaps in school engagement and are more likely to have mental health problems and to have basically behavior problems. So they, again, you see these gaps that are income related for kids entering school and the gaps don't get smaller. This is even, I think, more trouble. There's a, recent work shows that 
a consequence of rising income inequality is we have more residential segregation by income than we had 30 years ago. The nice paper on this is Sean Reardon and a colleague in the American Journal of Sociology about a year ago it was published. So basically, and, and this, get, this, this phenomenon of basically families with resources moving to neighborhoods with the more people like them. And this is, even the phenomenon is particularly striking among African American families. So the net effect is that leads, since most American kids still go to neighborhood schools, it's led to more segregation by income in schools. And there's a paper in the volume that documents there's been an increase. So effectively, poor kids are going to schools where their classmates are overwhelmingly other poor kids, and that's the case more than now than it was 30 years ago. And you see this, uh, and one way that plays out is altogether as growing gaps in skills between poor kids and rich kids. It was always a gap. In 75, 1975, for kids who were 14 in that year, it was a little less than a standard deviation. If 100 points is standard deviation. Notice over the next uh, 30 years, it gets about a third larger. This is work by Sean Reardon, also in this volume. And we also see growing gaps in educational attainments. That's Sue and Martha's paper in that volume as well. So all in all, basically we see is that we've got this combination of higher standards. Higher standards impact particularly on kids who are the most vulnerable and the income inequality Growth in income inequality has made it harder for kids from low-income families. And the last part of the story here is this growing role of the GED. Uh, GED has grown in importance. A number of states have reduced the minimum age. You can take the test from 18 to 16. There's uh, Jim Heckman has a couple of nice papers showing that with a kid's decide to drop out of school and some of them get that GED depends upon the relative difficulty of getting a GED versus getting a high school diploma. So it gets harder. We've got these rising standards. They impact particularly on poor kids. And the kids are more, poor kids are more likely to take this alternative route, which unfortunately does not serve them well, either in preparation of post-secondary education or in the labor market. Now, what do we do about this? I'm near done, unfortunately. Because the what, what do we do about this is much briefer. Thank you, five minutes, Sue, thank you, all right. I will do it. One is, we've got this problem of what's the evidence standard? And what I try to do is look at evidence from well done evaluations that uh, impacted on either dropout rates, high school graduation rates. The net effect of that is, we don't really don't have anything that talks that, that evidence on elementary school because almost no studies of elementary school interventions follow kids long enough to have impacts on high school graduation rates. So the first thing that you see, not a surprise, is a terrific paper in this volume by uh, a very good neuroscientist, Charles Nelson, on the importance of, on the uh, on the neuroscience of the first years of kids' lives and how those are particularly important years to intervene because of the rapid uh, brain development. So that, there's no question this is absolutely critical to I intervene in a variety of ways, including preschool education, and, and also important are supporting families. They're not, they're, these new poverty numbers that came out from the census yesterday are deeply troubling. There's now five studies with good causal designs that show when very low income families get more money, their kids do better in school. And a lot of, some, one of those studies is done looking at expansions of the earned income tax credit and how that helped families. So, it, so these are not correlational, they're causal and they're quite compelling and given this declining we're seeing in, in income for a great many American families, it's a troubling pattern. The third is improving 
high, middle schools and high school quality. Well, how do we do that? Well, we know there it makes a difference. So there's no question, even when kids enter high school with two strikes against them, good high schools can make a difference. These are all studies with good causal designs that have shown better quality schools really make a difference. And I could talk about those as particular studies in the Q&A if you want me to. Then the question is, of course, what does it mean to be a good high school serving poor kids? And that's where it gets tougher. So if we look at what are the characteristics, uh, there are schools that have clear goals and high expectations. They have a sense of community. They have a culture in which uh, a culture of respect. Teachers for the kids, kids for the teachers, kids for the kids, teachers for the teachers. They, uh, they have skilled teachers who are really working together to make instruction more consistent. The last one's in parentheses because I think it's a relatively new phenomenon. They make careful use of student assessment results to figure out where kids' particular skills are falling down and intervening uh, quickly. Now, I don't think anybody, I'm sure you would have your own language for this list. You'd probably add to things in the list. My guess is there's nobody who would really disagree with that list, that those things ought to be on it. Notice, however, those are characteristics of effective schools. They're not policy levers. So how do we get those things? And that's where it gets really tough. And here is this challenge of making policy evaluations more useful. Now, as many of you know, the Institute for Education Sciences was uh, started in 2002. Basically, the idea is this would be the NIH for education that would fund high quality research uh, that would provide good information to people making decisions about schools about how to improve them. I, yes, I, it's, its first director, uh, uh, Russ Whitehurst recognized that uh, education research had a very poor reputation, much of it deserved. And consequently, it was really important to have very high quality standards, as a result of which, in its first six years, IES funded more than 100 randomized controlled trials, which is clearly the kind of uh, gold standard for evaluations. Well, well uh, and, and I applaud that. But the challenge really is going forward is that uh, when you design randomized controlled trials, what are, the e what are the kind of interventions that lend themselves to that kind of evaluation? They're having an extra period for kids who are falling behind, having an after school program, having a very discreet intervention that doesn't change kids' fundamental experiences of what the school day is like for them. And as a result of which, very, almost, there are none of these evaluations that show, of particular school-based interventions that show striking impacts. Not a surprise. So the difficulty is, we know what we want. We want more schools that look like this. The difficulty is, the kind of evaluations we know best how to do don't don't map tightly, the policies we can evaluate, don't map tightly to these kinds of schools that we want to have. And particularly, um, you need to do a lot of things at once to create these kind of schools. That's much harder to evaluate. So I think really that's the challenge going forward. Uh, John Easton, the current uh, director of Institute of Education Sciences, you know, who spent a number of years directing the Chicago Consortium uh, our research consortium, which I think is a fabulous operation, really faces this challenge. How do we keep the uh, rigor of IES-funded research, so we really believe the results, but how do we recognize we need to be evaluating things more complicated than simply adding an after-school program? I think that really is the challenge. If you ask me about Brockton as an example of that challenge, I can do that, but Sue has told me I should, I should end. <laughs> so uh, this, is, this is where we've gone. And basically we saw five important patterns, four explanations, 
And what's, no, what's known about them is we've, we've learned some. We, we have an awful lot more we need to learn. We know what characterizes good high schools. We know them when we see them. It's much harder to figure out how to get there. Thank you very much. All right, uh, people want to uh, make a comment, ask a question. John, nice to see you here. Thanks for coming. Um, you started out by preparing the United States and then the rest of the world sort of got lost. So is there something, can you comment more on that comparison in particular? You're, you're really basically saying that the United States is that there's always been kind of, or this is my characterization, there's always been two worlds. The world that our kids live in, the world that other half kids live in, maybe I'm not so um, uh, and, and that must be in some sense less true. If that's the diagnosis of the problem here, then you, it sort of suggests that that is less true in other words here. But just comment on what did we learn from that comparison? Uh, yeah. Well, as, as, as I'm sure you know, I mean, um, international comparisons are hazardous turf because you can use, you can see many differences, but what do you learn from them about what U.S. should do given U.S. as different institutions? One thing is you see is all of these other countries that do better have much better social safety nets than the U.S. does. So, the, so that's, that's the kids don't start out as far behind as poor kids do in the U.S. I mean, that's striking, and you see this. Almost all, so that's, I think, that's the easy one. They also have, uh, teaching is a more respected occupation in most of these countries. They can be more selective in whom they bring in, into teaching. And they're here in tricky at term. Almost all of them have national curriculum and national exam systems. Now, why does that matter? Because in the United States, if you're teaching, if you're doing uh, pre-service training for an elementary school mathematics teacher, you have to think about, well, you know, you might end up, Sue, in, in a school where you'll be teaching Saxon math, which is a very uh, uh, traditional math. You might end up in a school where you're teaching everyday math that's very constructive. Uh, so we can't focus on what textbooks you're going to use or even what's going to be really at the core of what you're asked to teach. Well, that's the situation in the United States. It's very hard to have good instruction. Now, what do we do about that? Given, you know, local control has been, you know, part of the American scene for a long time, we're moving slowly towards, you know, we have these common core standards, how, whether they will be good standards. So I think there are, there are striking differences. Um, the other area where there are more differences are there's more paths through high school in many of these countries. Uh, in particular, there are apprenticeships, uh, which I think are important in creating opportunities. I think we, the evidence from the U.S. suggests this is, in other words, for many kids are asking, why should I be learning algebra? This doesn't connect to anything in my life. I, I, see, I don't know anybody who has a professional job. Why should I be learning these things? In many other countries, a lot of those kids are spend a day a week in, in internships as part of the secondary school training. Now, in those northern European countries where internships and apprenticeships work well, they have strong labor unions, they have a government, and businesses play a key role. It's a very different political system than the U.S. is. So what can the U.S. adopt and move from that? I think it's a challenge. But I see the evidence from, like, career academies, uh, uh, and some of the small high schools that work as suggesting we have to make education more relevant for kids in high school, particularly for poor kids. Connecting to experiences in middle class workplaces can be a part of the answer. We have a little evidence to support that. Uh, I guess staying on, on the international tech, um, how much or if any, uh, kind of the blame for America kind of falling behind be attributed to our relatively short school year. 
compared to um, several of the countries uh, that really leap from ahead of us? Uh, that's a good question. I think there is evidence, growing evidence. In fact, uh, uh, um, where's Steve, who I had lunch with? One of your mentor, Dave Marcotte, has done interesting work on the is it length of the school year, I believe, right? Showing that a longer school year from NASA experiments in the U.S. made a difference. One thing when you look at these schools, whether they be charter schools or uh, more or, you know, charter schools are public schools, you've got to be careful about the language, or uh, uh, other public schools that are successful in serving poor kids who come to school with real learning deficits. They find ways to more instructional time. You know, uh, Roland Fryer has a nice paper that's just come out about uh, the uh, uh, Promise Academy of the Harlem Children's Zone. Kids start school day at 7.30 with breakfast. They have time to, for remediation before they start classes. They're there till 5.30. They're there on Saturday. They're there in the summer. So basically, if kids start out with deficits, they need more time for instruction. And the time has to be used well. And they've done a nice job of figuring out how to use it well. In many of these small schools of choice in New York City, who are now are having to serve more kids with special education, they're saying, look, we can, we can finally get your kids to be able to pass these readings exams, but it's going to take six years. You can add instructional time that way. So I think it, clearly you got to have it, instructional time is a necessary but not sufficient condition. You've got to figure out how to use it well. Yes? Uh, okay. Hi. Um, I had a question about the relationship between um, increasing qualifying tests and graduation rates. Um, do you know about any studies that have tried to look at whether the tests mean that students would have made some progress, but when you're forcing them to make a lot of progress, they drop out? Or you're really just not giving a certificate to people with the same skills? So before, if you showed up every day, even if you didn't learn anything, you still got a degree, and now you don't? Okay, let me... I'm not 100% sure I understood. It is the case. I mean, that it is the case, and... Uh, uh, a, a book David Cohen, one of the authors of the Shopping Mall High School, and now an old book is, a, is really, I think you, you've said it really nicely, you know, in, in the 1970s, uh, before this kind of upgrading started, if you pretty much went to school most of the time, went to class most of the time, and didn't misbehave badly, you got to graduate. <laughs> and that really has changed in an important way. And I think, you know, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, you do want to have a, a, a kids graduating with skills. But there are these consequences for the most at-risk kids. So there's two questions. And, and, and one is, does the imposition of the exams lead kids to drop out? And there's some evidence, if you look at the most vulnerable groups, yes. Also, work we've done in Massachusetts, uh, using my Grissom discontinuity approach, if you fail the test, and compare it to kids who look equally skilled but just are a notch above it, are the kids who just fail more likely to drop out for the whole population? No. For uh, urban kids from low-income families, yes. And the gap is large, about 8 percentage points. Yes, ma'am. Um, at least from the little bit I know, disadvantage starts really early, not even in kindergarten, maybe as early as two or three years old. Absolutely. And so, you're, so going back to your point about the most vulnerable families, they start out really behind really early. But then secondly, this idea of characteristics of individual schools and characteristics of school systems. Because if you get one school to do really well, let's say, for the most advantaged kids, but you still have all these other disadvantaged kids in the rest of the city or the rest of the state or the rest of the county that still don't have opportunities. So it's one thing to say, well, can we do some tweaking to make this school and this principal better? But to make the whole system better and to kind of equalize equal, equal opportunity across the board is a lot more difficult. I don't know if you've thought about that question at all. Well, I think that's, you know, that's the very difficult question. Uh, in, in American literature, you know, in, in American uh, writing about schools, there have been these lighthouse schools written about for a very long time. If you look at Charles Silverman's book, written, I believe, in 1972, Crisis in the Classroom. 
You see the descriptions of the schools that succeeded where all the schools in very poor neighborhoods where all the schools around them uh, did not. But then if you go back five years later, typically the principal has moved on, the teachers have gotten kind of burned out, and no lesson has been spread. So the challenge had, we've had these rays of hope that have burned brightly in urban school systems for a very long time. What can we learn from those about how to create more effective systems of education? That's been what's the real struggle, because it's not doing simply one thing. It's a whole bunch of things, and that creates a, a, a serious evaluation problem. But I think that's, that, is, that is the challenge, to go beyond individual schools. And you've got to go beyond simply we need strong leadership. Yes, <laughs> strong leadership is really good. It really matters. It's important. But how do we create a system where we have systematically strong leaders? How do we have also, you know, a challenge for many of the strong uh, charter schools is um, they start out with these very young people, 22, 23 years old, who learn how to teach, typically not very good the first year. They work 24-7. They are incredibly dedicated. After two or three years, they really are making a difference. Then they get married. And they have a child, and they're like, and, and they can't do that anymore. Well, this is a big challenge. It's a challenge in these small schools of choice in New York. How do you move from a model that depends upon 24-7 of very young people to a sustainable model that still has the care for the kids, the high expectations, the improving instruction, but has doable jobs where people can have lives that continue to do them? I think the charter we were talking at lunch, the charter schools networks face that. I think this is a, a pervasive problem. Okay. Yes, sir. Go ahead. The blue? <laughs> um, I was actually wondering, you started to talk a little bit about when you were talking about charter schools, but I was wondering if there's been evidence of um, like programs like Teach for America increasing the amount of graduation rates, or if like um, possibly expanding something like that would has shown evidence of making it a factor. Uh, that's another uh, uh, controversial topic. Uh, the, the best study, it's always a problem, you know, there, are, there are selection problems that are pervasive because kids that typically are not, kids and, and teachers are not randomly assigned to each other, so you worry about the matching. And the best study is, was done uh, by mathematical policy research, which is a good policy Search from what they did is they found a number of elementary schools in which the principal, the, the deal of principal, deal with the principal was, you can, if, first of all, we have to have at least two fourth grades, two fifth grades, two sixth grades. Okay? Principal can divide up the kids any way they want. But then there has to be a coin flip as to, as to which of the fourth grade sections the Teacher for America teacher gets and which the teacher was already in the fourth grade in that school got. So we were randomizing uh, teachers. That was done in, uh, in a number of, in a, in, a lot, in a fairly large number of schools. And the question is, what, what was learned? Well, it, the outcome that is emphasized on the Teach for America website, and I'm a fan of Teach for America for what it does for the participants. I think it's, and I, I, I teach 12 or 15 Teach for America graduates every year. I love having them in class. They're smart. They're dedicated. Most of them are there because they have such a frustrating experience. They want to start a school and do it right. <laughs> uh, what you found was that the kids who are the Teach for America participant, on average, did a little better in math scores, no better in reading scores. So that's but that, I don't think that's the real story. When you look more carefully, and this is in the report, but you have to look for it, at what were the backgrounds of the non-TFA teachers in these schools where TFA teachers were placed? And the answer is, they were about the nation's least well-prepared teachers. They typically did not go to the University of Michigan. Uh, they overwhelmingly went to very low quality uh, preparation programs. 
They had very little student teaching. So, the, so one way of saying it is, yes, the kids did, who were TFA teachers, did better. But they did better than very ill-prepared uh, teachers. So what do you make of this? Well, it depends upon, if you say, if we as a nation are going to accept that the alternative to TFA is that the kids most in need of our best teachers are going to get our worst teachers. Does TFA help? Absolutely. It helps a little bit. But are we as a nation willing to accept that premise of, well, what we can do is TFA? Because when you talk to TFA teachers, how many of you, have to, how many TFA uh, participants are in the, out here? So uh, let me, so, we, at least we got three or four. My experience in talking with the many I've talked with would say they were better in their second year than in their first. They had a very difficult experience because they were somewhat resented by the other teachers in their schools. Because uh, again, you know, because the TFA teachers went, were very well educated, the other teachers in these schools were not. Because remember, where are TFA teachers placed? They're placed in the schools that can't attract regular teachers. So the ones who are there are the ones who can't find another job. Now there are exceptions. There are some wonderful teachers in every school, but there are not enough of them. So I think, I think TFA is fabulous. One of uh, our doctoral students did a very nice dissertation showing that a strikingly large percentage of TFA participants stay in education broadly defined as, as you are. And that's great. I think that's absolutely terrific. As a strategy to solve these enormous gaps, high school graduation rates that we've seen, I don't think it does. Yeah. Now, could you touch on the issue of uh, year-round education, given that 99 percent of the population is in non-farm employment? I mean, we have kids that are, you know, forget what they learned all summer. Um, you know, and, you know, it, it's a it's a crazy system to have a school system that, you know goes on vacation for three months a year and their parents are working all year round if they have a job, that is. I, I, I think more instructional time can really make a difference. I'd want to do the evaluation very carefully with a really good design because, you know, what you don't want to do is just what you want to be sure the time, it's, it's a bit like, you know, the class size story. You know, if you, you lower class size, but you don't use time in any different way, not much happens. Well, if the net effect the teacher says, okay, I can slow down. I, kids are gonna write the same three essays over the year, but now I'll spread it over 11 months instead of over eight months. Uh, so I, I think it creates opportunity, but we need to really think through what are the design, what are the incentives for kids, for the professional educators, to be sure that kids have a very different experience. And, and I think we potentially can do it. There are places that do it. But how do we map this to policies, I think, is a real challenge. Yeah, uh, could that also be dangerous to, like, the school is a drag effect, too? Because, I mean, as you said, <coughs> like, if you're just kind of sitting them in there and you're not teaching them any more than you would in the eight months, it's kind of just keeping them there <coughs> the institution that really doing anything. Well, well, this is why, well, you know, it can't be just more of the... More of the more of the same. You know, I think that's, I mean, that's just, you know, we have to figure out how to use time in ways that makes education more relevant for these kids. I mean, there are models. I mean, it's not that we don't, not that we know nothing. There are things to be done, but it can't simply be more of the same. Yes, ma'am? Uh, is there any evidence of studies of community mobilization in schools and schools? Because it seems to be part of the problem. I do some work in Detroit, is that the community support for education is very truncated. And, uh, and I, I, there's been some effort to organize the community to see, to really get parents and community residents and businesses in support of education. Is there any evidence that that has helped? Well, you know, one of the hard things is random, randomized controlled trials are terrific at the end of the day being able to say whatever the treatment was made a difference or did not. It basically though you can't, if, if it's a complex intervention, you don't know the relative importance of different pieces of this. 
Now these small schools, are basically under Joel Klein in New York City, very large dysfunctional high schools in the poorest areas, South Bronx, for example, were broken up. Now, it were closed. But what they did in a very interesting way is they had a competition to start small schools. And that, and, but to start a small school, you had to have a community partner. And the community partner, for example, with things like East Side Settlement House was a community partner. But that's not all that was there. They did lots of other things as well. They had students got to choose their schools. You had kids who, for the most part, wanted to be there. They had purse, we had weighted per student budgeting. So uh, schools got the money for the kids. They got more money if they served poor kids. They did a whole bunch of different things. Now, the evaluation shows that kids who went to these, who won a lottery to go to these small schools of choice, fared significantly better than they otherwise would have. And a, but it's a package of things. And it has to be a package of things. Another piece of that package, again, is reorganizing finances at the central level. So it's this is, the difficulty here is that systemic change requires a package of things. But it's very hard to figure out what, what are the important pieces. One uh, take maybe one or two more questions, and then we'll. Sure. I, I'm, uh, so how about this? You, yeah. I'm just thinking about not knowing the data, the comparison between the United States and the other Western European countries, but the picture that you've all given is that the Western European countries are doing so much better than we are. Now, it seems to me that the, the, the gap between the majority population and the minority population in the Western European countries, and the minority population is mostly Muslim, has got to be just as large and just as problematic with respect to educational issues as we see in outcomes for blacks and Hispanics in the United States. So it must be that the overall population that is, you know, uh, Arab, uh, you know, Northern uh, African is much smaller in those countries and it doesn't exert such a large influence in the total outcomes. While in our case, if you add 12% black Americans, 15% Hispanics, I mean, that's about 27 percent of the population, so that they do make a whole lot of difference. So that, that would have to be taken into account in the comparisons also, because the, their inequality isn't any better than ours is, is my point. Yeah. It, you, you, you may be right. I mean, the, you know, the depends on which European country you're talking yeah. about, and they have much more Im immigration you know, they have a, a lot now, but I think you, that's why these international comparisons are so, are so, are so hazardous. But I think, it's, I think the point is, is an important one, and we need to know more. Who are those minorities? How are they faring? How many are they? Last question. <coughs> so you had your, you had your, oh, yeah. Um, what have been the effects of the growing classroom sizes and the integration of healthy and varying degrees of assisting children into those growing classroom sizes? Because nowadays teachers are teaching 30 plus kids. I know when I was in high school and younger, it was 20. You know, and then you throw the elderly students on top of it. That's got to be very difficult for an educator to reach across the elderly students. Uh, I think that's right. I mean, in our evidence on this, Brian and Sue may know more about the detailed evidence on this than I do. I'm thinking about the Hanushek study that uh, finds. Uh, Having special ed kids in the class did not do any any any, any negative had not have a negative impact on the non-disabled learning kids. But there's a question of the numbers. There's also a question of does uh, how much money comes with those disabled kids? All those, all the, and I think that's the key piece of it. Is you know most educators I talked I spent in New, uh, July in New York talking educators to these small schools, and they said you know. It's a real challenge. We've got to figure out how to do it. And it takes time. What they're doing in these small schools is they're having more of their teachers get the certification to deal with kids with special needs. And if they do that, and if these kids come with this weighted per student funding with enough extra money to pay for the help, they feel they can do it. They're going to have to keep those kids for a couple of years. But they need the money and they need the time. So it's very easy. If you do the same things, it's not going to do it. I should probably stop. Uh, thank you very much.